I owe significant thanks to the British Museum and the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers for the great honour you do in asking me to give this, the 2015 Dingwall Below Lecture. Von Clausewitz famously said, War is the continuation of politics by other means. I want to extend that aphorism to say that commerce is largely war, fought not with guns, but by other means. I'm going to use the life of Robert Lenoir as a backbone or skeleton on which to hang various stories that will reinforce the point. Just in case anyone has stumbled across this lecture and has no idea who Robert Lenoir was, let me summarise up front quite simply by describing him as the chief horological engineer for the manufacturer of the largest number of clocks and watches in Britain in the 20th century. But he has largely gone unremarked in the literature so far, and I hope that in this lecture I can begin to address that. I'm going to start by breaking entirely with tradition. It's customary with biography to begin with a birth, and to progress chronologically through someone's life. Not this time. The meat and drink of what I want to cover lies in the first 50-odd years of Robert Lenoir's life, and much of it early on in those years. So forgive me if I start at the end. It's the time when some people I've talked to recently met Robert. Jonathan Betts and Paul Buck have both told me about meeting Robert as they shook hands to receive their BHI examination certificates in the early 1970s. Robert Lenoir's photo albums were filled with shots of him shaking hands with people, winning the Bessemer Prize in 1960, or giving a long service award, perhaps crowning a beauty queen on the Smith's staff in Cheltenham. And yes, this really did happen. There were often presentations of one sort or another. And then, of course, there were speeches. At BHI events, for example, like this centenary dinner in Cheltenham in 1958, where Jacob Bronowski and Rita Koblenz, his wife, who lived near Robert, were his guests. I'm so sorry that Lisa Jardine, their daughter, could not be in the audience for this lecture. When I found the picture months ago, I sent it to Lisa and we chatted about the biography of her father she was compiling. At the 1960 BHI annual general meeting, Knowles Brown, coincidentally the first chairman of the AHS, Robert Lenoir and Bateman, the managing director of Ingersoll, spoke about the state of the horological industry. Knowles Brown spoke of the past, Bateman of the future. It was left to Robert to cover the present. He and other Smith's colleagues had been on amazing fact-finding missions to Russia recently, and this was a time of a significant threat of competition from the Eastern Bloc. Knowles Brown quipped Robert's talk could well be entitled Rouge et le Noir. Lenoir retired from Smith's in early 1965, but then again he didn't. He, he certainly had the retirement parties, and here he is celebrating with Ralph Gordon Smith, Dennis Barrett and Cedric Bolt. On his retirement, the letters he received from all around the world are a huge testament to the high regard in which he was held. But he didn't really retire. He was retained as a consultant by Smith's for many more years. And he travelled all round the world, advising people on setting up watch manufacturing operations, even as far away as Guam. He sat on numerous committees for the establishment of standards in materials and in parts. For example, leading the UK delegation to a meeting in Moscow of the International Standards Organisation on one occasion. On the BHI front... Robert served as chairman in 1962 and 1963, and then again in 1970. The 60s and 70s were, I'm sure, a very happy time for Lenoir, spent with his wife of many, many years, and with two children now well grown up. He loved to travel, 
and his consultancy roles took him to Russia, Switzerland, America, all round the globe, and everywhere he was greeted as a respected old friend. I'm convinced one should retain an image of Lenoir as a very happy man, loved by friends, family and many former colleagues. But there is a negative aspect to the last 20 or so years of his life. It was caught in the detailed notes written by his friend Wilfred Kahn, not long after Robert's death in 1979. Put simply, so much that he had worked for so hard over the four decades after the Great War was simply washed away in a tidal wave of intense foreign competition and the collapse, one more time, of the British horological industry. But I don't want to dwell on the end of the story. There is a lot to be covered in looking at the earlier years. Paris, 7 January 1898, the 16th arrondissement, near the Porte Saint-Cloud, 128 Rue Michel-Ange. Enter Robert Jean-Maurice Lenoir. He was one of four children, born to Auguste and Marguerite Lenoir. Here is a picture of Auguste's parents, but Auguste, Lenoir's father, is actually absent in the photo family albums for a reason. His wealthy father-in-law was the secretary of the Otoy Racecourse, where the family also charmingly kept cows in a neighbouring field. The young Auguste fell into bad company, not among the cows, you understand, but among the gambling fraternity at his father-in-law's racecourse. Losing a vast amount of money on horses and cards in 1909 spelled the end of his marriage, and Marguerite took custody of the children. Three years later, she married Fernand Henri Dietrich, known in the family as Papa Dietrich, and eventually Robert gained stepbrothers and sisters. Dietrich had trained at the École d'Horlogerie in Paris, and later worked at Etablissement Edmond Geiger, a fact I only recently discovered and which explains so much. Robert's first schooling was at Le Collège de Saint-Germain-en-Laye, near Paris. Surely directed by his clockmaker stepfather, at the age of 15, he enrolled at the Technicum du Locle, the horological school at Le Locle in Switzerland. Two of his brothers also went through horological school, although at Clues. One of them was lost in the Great War, and another changed career, so Robert was the only one to follow in his father's footsteps. At Le Locke, Robert's teacher was James César Peloton. Aha, you may be thinking, of course, the well-known watch brand James C. Peloton launched at the Baal Fair in 2002 with the wonderful strapline watchmaker since 1895. This modern company has revived the name of James César Peloton, member of a distinguished line of watchmakers whose book on escapements is an important text. From 1903 onwards and for 36 years in total, Peloton worked at the Technicum du Loc teaching escapement theory from 1908. Internet forums occasionally produce questions about Robert's true watchmaking credentials. Well, a partial answer is that we know he spent three years at one of the finest schools with one of the finest teachers specialising in escapements. Robert was at Le Loc as the Great War broke out and remained two further years through to 1916 before completing his training aged 18. Robert volunteered for the army in November 1916 and was posted as an NCO to the 82nd Regiment of Heavy Artillery at Nogent-sur-Seine. He went up to the front in February 1917 to Moulin de Lafaux, acting as a forward observer for the artillery. Within months, his environment therefore changed from the near-silent world of watchmaking to the deafening roar of high-explosive destruction. Conflict indeed. Remarkably, an exercise book he kept by him in the trenches has survived. It contains the poems that he wrote. 
Unsurprisingly, they are somewhat immature and maudlin, and on occasions particularly gloomy, but they reveal a sensitive character. Number 2981 Sergeant Robert Lenoir was severely wounded on the 23rd of April 1917 at Loy. The official report describes him as a gunner of exemplary devotion to duty. He was wounded by shell splinters while resolutely endeavouring to extinguish a fire in an ammunition dump caused by enemy bombardment. Yes, he was indeed trying to put out a fire in an ammunition dump. He was evacuated to hospital at Soissons for surgery and then transferred to Dieppe. He returned to the front in June 1917, but two months later was gassed and evacuated to hospital at Toul. On discharge, he returned yet once more to the front, this time to Verdun, in September 1918, with the 28th Regiment of Heavy Artillery. And there he saw out the war. For all these exploits and his service, he was awarded the Croix de Guerre, also the Croix de Combattante Volontaire and the Médaille de Verdun. And here we can see the little group of dress medals that he would wear when required to official functions later in life. Soldiers did not return to their homes in the days immediately after the armistice was signed. It took months for demobilisation to occur. And here are views of soldiers returned to Paris in early 1919. And a similar view at the Otoy metro station, close to Robert's house. Robert's homecoming may have resembled this. In 1919, surely with help from his stepfather, Robert spent time at Edmond Gégère in Paris, and then Le Coultre in Le Sentier, in the Vallée du Joux, home of many famous Swiss watchmaking firms. In May 2015, I lectured about how important aircraft instruments and then motor car instruments were to these two allied firms. Late on in life, Robert wrote to his friend Wilfred Kahn. It was very kind of you to send the pictures of the Model A speedometer, which I used to assemble in the Rue du Louvre before I set off towards Wilsdon. I was particularly pleased to have a picture of the mechanism, which I always thought and still think was a masterpiece. The Model B, C and D were all made at Le Coultre to a design from a director of Noman Rhone, who was also a director of Gégé. We should note that Gnome and Rhone was a major French aircraft engine maker in the Great War. So here, once more, we have evidence of the way in which post-war engineering in Europe brought together the worlds of aviation and horology. There must have been much more to this young recruit, now 21 years old, than just being a speedometer assembler, because he was now selected for a new role. His stepfather had trained at the École d'Horlogerie in Paris, but so had someone else at Gégé, a future chairman of Gégé Le Coulge, Henri Rodenet, who had finished first in his class in 1902 before going on to collaborate with Edmond Gégé. It was Rodenet who sent Lenoir to London in August 1920 with a very different brief. Since before the Great War, the firm of Rotax, run by Herman and Eugène Aaron, had operated in motor accessories in London, particularly in car lighting, from premises known as Chandus Works, Wilsdon Junction, NW10. Gégé had appointed Rotax as its agent to sell Gégé chronometric speedometers, but they weren't doing a very good job, and this was the reason Rodinet sent Robert to London in August 1920, initially for just two months, to bolster the sales effort. He found digs in Brondersbury, where his landlady would note the ups and downs in Robert's health, as steel splinters from his wartime injuries would shift position and cause internal bleeding. Each week, Herman Aaron and Robert went to Coventry, to the heart of the motor industry, where Aaron had top-level connections. Robert was thus introduced to the chief engineers, and they let him test GG speedometers on their cars. Robert's notes recall him taking a bag of tools and a slide rule to London. 
the exercise book that had accompanied him in the trenches, was also still on hand, and it reveals his workings as he calculated the size of the pulleys needed to take a drive from the cardan shaft. He had those turned up at Rotax. He drilled the chassis, fitted the split pulleys and drive belts, and he connected up the flexible drive, and then cut accurate holes in the bulkhead or the dashboard to accept the speedometer head. Sales of Zheger equipment started to pick up, and Aaron persuaded Zheger Paris to allow Robert to stay in London. Two rooms at Rotax were allocated, and sales trips went further afield to Birmingham, Manchester and Wolverhampton. Business was good, with supply contracts awarded by several firms. Robert spent weekends at Brooklands, getting to know racing drivers, including Seagrave, Kadon and Campbell, developing friendships and persuading them to fit his instruments. And then in April 1924, the business was transformed from an agency into a limited liability company, Edmond Gégé London Limited, majority owned by a combination of Gégé and Le Couch, with a handful of shares going to Lenoir and a few other key individuals. The directors were all from Gégé Paris, key among them being Gustave Delage. Perhaps it will come as no surprise that Delage was both the design engineer and business mind behind Newport, producer of the Great War fighter plane, the Newport 17. Delage was the principal controlling mind behind the combination of Gégé and Le Couch, initially under the holding company Sapic, through till his death in 1946. A small factory was established on St Leonard's Road at Willesden Junction, opposite Rotax and, as one employee remembered, close by to a smelly soap factory. The Buy British movement was taking off, so to avoid sending faulty instruments back to Paris, a repair shop was set up and René Le Couch came over from Le Sentier. To make instruments in London, duplicate tooling, jigs and fixtures came from Paris, as did French and Swiss engineers to commission it, training skilled British watch and clock repairers who were engaged and trained to repair chronometric speedometers. Robert acted as translator between the two groups, and the process introduced Robert to the control of skilled labour. Germany was now recovering fast, and cheap clocks flooding into the UK meant it was easy for Zheger to recruit skilled British staff. Once more, conflict in the background. Supplies of the first British-made speedometers were shipped to Humber and other customers by late 1925. But the initial sales figures were disappointing. A letter from Gustave Delage to Hermann Aaron of June 1926 offers interesting evidence. It was clear the British car industry was at that moment going through a rough period. For Zheger, over a year, they had sold 21,000 speedometers and 10,000 clocks. This, Delage reveals, was just one third of the factory's capacity, so it was very much underloaded. A turning point in Robert's fortunes apparently came with the supply by Zheja of one of its chronometric speedometers to Austin for testing on its successful seven horsepower car. News of the test filtered back through channels to Smith's who were tight with Austin. Here was a threat to Smith's existing business with Austin and the folk memory is that this brought about the acquisition by Smith's. However, I now suspect that Delage was already talking to Gordon Smith about possibilities and the situation was simply somewhat forced when Smith's was prosecuted in early 1927 for selling as British its car clocks that had Swiss escapements. The Zheger files show that they were well aware in Paris of the affair and Delage and Smith were meeting each other by June or July 1927 to discuss a deal, agreed soon after with Smith's acquiring 75% of Zheger London. It's important to remember this meant Zheger retained 25%. I've discussed elsewhere the advantages the deal gave Smith's, which of course included acquiring Robert Lenoir. Remember, Gordon Smith was heard saying, Lenoir is the only one who really understands the business. 
Delage was planning long term as well. He and Jacques David Lecouche were concerned over declining business on the continent and problems with part supply. They foresaw a price collapse, and they knew it was possibly cheaper to produce clocks in London than Switzerland. Selling down 75% returned much needed capital to Jeje, and Delage's ideas sat neatly with the ambitions of Gordon Smith. Gordon Smith's forward planning can be seen in his purchase of nine and a half acres of land in late 1927 on the North Circular Road, close to Staples Corner. Over the course of the next year, a further deal was thrashed out with Delage and Lecoultre to form the All British Escapement Company, and a definitive agreement was signed in October 1928. I suspect, by the way, when members of internet forums argue over Jeje Lecoultre's influence on later Smith's watches, they forget the fact that the two companies were 50-50 joint venture partners in ABEC for many, many years. The terms of the ABAC deal were intriguing. Le Couch was obliged to establish a factory capable of producing 1,000 escapements per day, initially to be installed in Switzerland, only later to be transferred to the UK. Smith's contracted to source all its escapement requirements from ABEC for a minimum of 15 years. All looked set fair, and then the political world intervened to upset the apple cart. The general election of 1929 resulted in a hung parliament, leading to two years of uncertainty on import taxes. This uncertainty over the economics kept ABEX equipment in Switzerland until 1931, but it was finally in production at Staples Corner late that year. The new factory was called Kronos Works, and Jeje London had already moved there in April 1930. While ABEX's expansion had been slowed, Jeje's speedometer business by contrast had expanded, and Robert, the works manager, was coping with increased production schedules. Robert made many visits to Switzerland over the several years it took to plan for ABEX eventually to open in London. He knew the Lecoultre and Jeje factories depended on skills developed over considerable periods of time, and he realised he could not simply bring in raw British recruits to a London factory and rapidly train them to the same standards as the Swiss and French. The solution was clear and intriguingly foreshadows the longer-term development of watch manufacture at Smith's. Robert chose to de-skill operations. A nice example of this is embodied in a device he patented in 1932 with Percy Brisley Ferris, which enabled the adjustment of balance wheels to time using a photoelectric cell in place of a skilled observer and operative. Many operations were split down into simple routines, and large numbers of highly specialised jigs were devised to ensure accuracy. Where possible, tasks were automated. All of this fed back into reduced labour costs, and when ABEC finally produced escapements, their pricing could compare with the landed cost of the Swiss import. Of course, the qualifier there of landed cost is a pretty large qualifier. ABEC established volume production of escapements by the end of 1931. By 1932, 30,000 escapements had been made, and by 1935, 1 million. The very late 1920s saw a confluence of several key issues for Robert. On the one hand, his life was turned on its head at work by the arrival of Smiths, who acquired control of his employer and began directing his energies in a whole new enterprise. At the same time, he met Marjorie, and a romance flourished, which, according to Robert's friend Wilfred, was based on a mutual interest in tennis and Riley Cars. He no longer sounds like a Frenchman, does he? The pair were married in Paris in 1932. So far, Robert had endured some 13 or 14 years of haemorrhages as shell splinters shifted, with a constant need for cortisone to deal with pain. But he had one final operation in 1932, which confirmed one last piece of splinter was firmly encased in scar tissue and there it remained for the rest of his life. 
the couple returned from honeymoon to set up home in Mill Hill in London, and their first child, Molly Simone, was born three years later. Of course, there was another baby in Lenoir's life, Kronos Works. In parallel, Gordon Smith was busy expanding Smith's clock business with synchronous clocks and also with acquisitions. Williamson's and Enfield, the two main examples. Alongside this, the capacity to volume produce platform escapements, which Lenoir had delivered, needed to be leveraged. The first order had been from the Horstman Gear Company, but Gordon wanted Kronos escapements in clocks on people's bedside tables and mantelpieces, not in anonymous time switches. The result was a small eight-day 19-line calotte clock for the UK market, for which Le Coultre supplied all the required tooling, and Robert was at the heart of the project. All this expansion gave rise to the need for the new MA2 factory alongside the Kronos works. The Swiss automatics and gear cutting equipment which had been installed in Kronos was moved next door to MA2, leaving room for the 19-line movement assembly. I'm largely going to gloss over the rest of the 1930s, in which Smith's consolidated a position in domestic clocks. But as I've argued elsewhere, while this may technically have been between the wars, there was in fact all sorts of conflict waging, and the German dumping of clocks is just one aspect. Think about the watch world as well. Switzerland managed to export more than 5 million watches to Britain each year from the mid-1930s, and these were the cheapest possible. By contrast, the average price the Swiss achieved for watches exported to Germany in 1936 was nearly four times higher than in Britain. The Chamber of Commerce journal noted in mid-1937 that Britain is becoming practically the dumping ground for the lowest-priced watches. British acceptance of this was a problem in later years. But let's move now to the real war. If you heard my Bang on Time lecture, you'll recall this anti-aircraft shell fuse. It's a Type 206, but there are lots of close cousins. The design is pre-Great War and came from Gebrüder Thiel in Rula in eastern Germany. Make a mental note of that reference to Gebrüder Thiel. In 1939, the director of Woolwich Arsenal, Mr Oliphant, invited Robert to tender for the production of the Type 206 fuse. And Smiths secured the business tooling up to be ready for full production just prior to the war. And yes, both sides used the same design of fuse against each other. This invitation from Woolwich was typical. As Britain came closer to war in 1939, so Robert's special abilities and position became more critically important. At one level, of course, in Smith's, but beyond Smith's as well, as part of the wider preparation for war. Here was the Frenchman, also a Swiss-trained watchmaker, with a fabulous network of contacts across Europe. Robert travelled many times to France, Switzerland and Germany during early 1939 on various missions. Horologists prefer the term balance spring to hairspring, but throughout his career Robert used the term hairspring and for this lecture I will do the same. Smiths imported hairsprings for years from a black forest firm in Schramburg, named after its founder, Karl Huss. Its factory sat close to the extraordinary tiered works of Junggans in Schramburg. Robert agreed a transaction with Karl Huss to acquire the machinery to produce hairsprings in the UK and travelled to Basel in July 1939 to work on getting the shipment made as soon as possible. War between Germany and Britain was declared on the 3rd of September, yet, remarkably, the last shipment of equipment didn't leave Schramburg until well after that date. All the machinery was destined for Cleve Grange, at Bishop's Cleve, Cheltenham, which became the home of British Precision Springs, presided over by a very close friend of Robert's, Wilf Kelly. By the end of 1940, the Grange was in production, 
and would go on to make 24 million hairsprings by the end of the war. At its height, in the 1960s, it was making 1 million hairsprings per month. Another vital component was synthetic jewels. I've talked elsewhere about the extraordinary diplomatic smuggling of watch jewels, but more information has emerged recently. Sir Alan Gordon-Smith joined the Ministry of Aircraft Production in early 1940. Lenoir's notes comment that Gordon-Smith specialised in anything that was considered unobtainable. Gordon Smith rapidly discovered the Ministry was desperate to find a source of aluminium oxide from which synthetic jewels are manufactured. Here is a classic example of networking. Gordon Smith explained the problem to Lenoir. From his Jeje days, Lenoir knew George Roche, who had worked under Louis Cotillon at his old client, Sunbeam Talbot Dirac, and whom many of you will know as having gone on to produce some outstanding cars. Lenoir's notes go on, I mentioned this problem to my old friend George Rush, and, much to my surprise, he told me that he had a cousin who was manager of a works making synthetic aluminium oxide. I reported this to Sir Alan, who asked me to phone and arrange a meeting in Paris in two days' time. Max Baikowski was the owner of that factory in Annecy in France, where about 100 small furnaces crystallised powdered aluminium oxide at around 2,000 degrees. Baikowski travelled at short notice to Paris on the 4th of May, while Alan Gordon-Smith and Robert Lenoir flew in a de Havilland Flamingo the same day. And Robert's notes say the pilot hedge-hopped to avoid encountering enemy fighters. There were risks. Bear in mind that modern historians see the Battle of Britain as having started in May 1940, over the fields of France, not in July over Kent. By the end of May, Bob Stanford Tuck was already an ace. Lenoir and Gordon Smith persuaded Baikowski to deliver the maximum possible quantity of aluminium oxide to the UK, and three quarters of the amount ordered was delivered before the supply route was cut with the fall of France. What happened to it is a story for another day. A quick aside on Baikowski's factory. He was clearly a friend, an ally, but later in the war it became expedient for the British to bomb his factory to bits. If you know your 617 history, you might recall Leonard Cheshire marking the Noman Rhone factory in Limoges from a height of 50 to 100 feet and doing three runs at low level first to warn the workers to get out. Robert's notes describe meeting Baikowski in Annecy after the war. He said, Baikowski was rebuilding a new works on the site of the old one, and we had a very friendly reception from him, and all those we met could only admire the RAF for the care in giving due warning and for their accuracy. How remarkable. Much of Robert's war was taken up in producing materiel of one sort or another. Probably just before that trip to Paris to see Baikowski, he'd been involved in a rush job to produce a special fuse for a fluvial mine. These were used in May 1940 to mine the rivers in France under Operation Royal Marine, which Churchill enthusiastically claimed to be his idea. A prototype was produced in 24 hours based on an existing eight-day watch movement. Robert and a colleague were in New Haven Harbour in the middle of the night, adjusting the fuses for the first raid, completed by a unit that left at 4am. A contract for 50,000 fuses resulted. No wonder Robert was a member of the Inter-Service Fuse Research Group. He worked with Vickers and the Royal Ordnance Factories on problems in the design and manufacture of anti-aircraft mechanical fuses. And he used the facilities at Smith's Shadow Factory at Cheltenham in cooperation with the Coventry Gauge Company to produce the machines that would in turn create the hobs and cutters needed by the Ordnance Factories. Those of you who witnessed my Bang On Time lecture might remember the Mark IV mine release mechanism. It was Robert who redesigned the mechanism, previously an imported shield reform design from Switzerland, 
so that it could be made in-house at Smith's. A big project was the standardisation of raw materials. Robert worked with Smith's chief metallurgist at Cheltenham to help standardise and control the quality of raw materials used in engineering. Smith's set the specifications, and the Ministry of Aircraft Production sponsored their production elsewhere. Items like steel rods for automatic work, steel strip for pressing out small components, brass rods and highly finished brass strip all produced to ensure good machinability. The specifications laid down during this period became the basis of British standards in use much later. Everything Robert did was overshadowed by a shortage of fine machine tools, and this in turn reflected the isolation of Switzerland, which had been inadequately foreseen. The Ministry for Economic Warfare had a tightrope to walk in managing relations with Switzerland, knowing that as a neutral it continued to have relations both with Allied and Axis powers. More on that later. Before leaving the war, it's worth making a comment that addresses some of the mythology about Smiths in wartime. It's entirely clear that successful volume production of wristwatches did not occur until a couple of years after the war ended. But we know Alan Gordon Smith presented a wristwatch to the King on the 19th of July 1944 at Cheltenham. Here's Lenoir with the King that very day with a range of parts arranged in front of them. Now most of these are larger than watch scale, but the compartmented box that Lenoir is pointing to is surely the reason the king is beginning to pull back his cuff. The two were probably talking about wristwatches, and we know the king had a problem with his watch that day. What they were probably looking at were parts for one of these, a pre-production 12-line wristwatch. It's somewhat crude, with no timing screws on the balance, for example. But this slide shows how the geometry of the escapement was shared between the earlier 19-line watches, already in production, probably by 1943, and the 12-line watch. If making the escapement was already possible, the wristwatch became feasible. The King left his own wristwatch behind that day to be serviced, and Lenoir sent it on soon after and kept a copy of the thank you letter from the palace in his papers. Robert Lenoir was very much part of the planning for post-war industry and generally at a very practical level. Weeks before VE Day, Robert was in Basel looking for machine tools at the industrial fair. He flew by military plane to Paris on the 19th of April, returning on the 30th. From Paris, he was driven by an RAF driver to the Swiss border, on very bad roads across temporary bridges. He'd been sent by the Ministry of Aircraft Production to report on machinery for producing fuses and instruments. The journey took him close enough to hear the machine gun fire of the French First Army's advance. He encountered more air raid warnings in Switzerland at this stage in the war than he was used to in London, on account of the US Air Force raids taking place nearby, and the US had just bombed both Zurich and Basel in March by mistake. VE Day, 8th of May 1945, but no rest for the wicked. Within weeks, Robert was elected a member of the Inter-Allied Missions sent to Germany to investigate its factories, including the clock factories. A team of a dozen scientists and technicians was assembled. The main force left the UK on the 28th of June, but these were sensitive times. Germany was being carved into four main zones between the Russians, French, British and Americans. The Royal Ordnance technicians were especially keen to survey the fuse designs and manufacturing capacity of, guess who? Gebrude Thiel in Rula, whom I mentioned before. Because it was clear Rula would fall in the Soviet zone, Robert left well ahead of all his colleagues on the 18th of June 1945, travelling via Frankfurt, in special duties uniform and with the courtesy rank of Colonel. From US Army HQ in Frankfurt, he was allocated a jeep and made his way eastwards to Rula, 
along the way meeting huge numbers of German civilians fleeing from the advancing Russians. At the Teal factory, Robert bumped into his old friend Oliphant from Woolwich Arsenal, who was sketching fast because the local German manager claimed that all the original drawings had been burned and the UK team would have to clear out very soon. The day after Robert's arrival, a Teal salesman took him on one side and asked about the chances of selling their cheap watches in the UK. Robert asked how they might do that if they no longer had any drawings and wouldn't be in a position to manufacture for some time. The reply came, but what if the directors had kept copies? It emerged the directors kept their private papers in safe custody at the local branch of Dresdner Bank at Eisenach. Robert hurtled off with a US Army intelligence officer, where the bank manager apologised he couldn't do anything without the keys to the relevant vault held by the Tiedel directors. This didn't sit very well with the intelligence officer, so the vault door was quickly forced. Complete sets of microfilms of watch movements and fuse mechanisms were found hidden in deed boxes and packed off with Oliphant to Woolwich Arsenal. All this clearly really stuck in Robert's mind, given the detail in which he later wrote it up. In all, he spent 30 days on this trip visiting the Black Forest, taking a lot of pictures on the way. He went back in October with the Ministry of Aircraft Production, and then went twice in November with the British Intelligence Objectives Committee, first to Hamburg to investigate fuse production and then on for an unspecified purpose to Bad Oeynhausen, the post-war centre for British intelligence in Germany, too secret for his own notes. He made similar trips to Italy and Switzerland, but the experience of surveying the Black Forest industries would have been highly sobering. The observers were very struck by the rigorous training and education available in the clock factories, but there was another strongly telling element which will have coloured Anglo-Swiss relations. One of the official reports runs as follows. Practically all plants in the last few years, from the largest to the smallest, had acquired an astonishingly large number of new Swiss and German machine tools of the best quality. The equipment includes such items as Swiss jig borers, Swiss plate routing machines, Swiss precision multiple plate drilling machines, various types of Swiss automatic screw machines, various types of Swiss machines for cutting pinions and wheels, etc. They also had excellent Swiss tool-making equipment, some of which was highly specialised. It had been obvious in diplomatic and intelligence circles that the Swiss had supplied equipment to the Germans. Indeed, this was an accepted element in the overall gamesmanship of dealing with Switzerland. But it may have surprised the observers arriving from UK industry to see quite how they had been disadvantaged on the machine tool front. Now, post-war, Smiths were at the heart of attempting to build a British watch industry. There were huge obstacles in shortages of materials and tools, foreign competition and much more. If the wartime Anglo-Swiss relationship was complex, it remained so now in the horological arena. At one level, Anglo-Swiss relations were extremely good. Post-war, the UK's prestige was high in Switzerland. It intervened to defend Switzerland from criticism from the other allies, and its reasons were clear. Britain needed both substantial financial help from the Swiss, and it needed Swiss machine tools. For their part, the Swiss wanted military goods, and Britain was prepared to supply them. But a willingness to provide credit to the British was one thing. For the Swiss watchmaking and associated toolmaking industries to help was another. The power of monopolies such as Ebosch Trust to control the industry was remarkable. Lenoir's papers offer interesting evidence. But we must first mention the arrival of another baby in May 1946, another Robert who helped enormously with material for this lecture. In August, 
Robert left his new son of three months for a trip to Switzerland, which he wrote up in detail. There was a busy schedule, with visits to the Ministry of Commerce and Industry to complain about the long delay in the delivery of machine tools. Some items were scheduled to arrive in 1947, but some were only expected to arrive in 1948. Lenoir met two sorts of reception. He met friends at firms such as Bechler, and received promises of help with speedy dispatch, but he also met obstruction. Take the example of Jacques and Hustler, controlled by Eboche Trust, which offered a minimum two-year delivery delay. Overall, Robert's notes suggest he was struggling to secure equipment. Probably compelled by the political elite on both sides, a joint Anglo-Swiss horological committee came into being. The first meeting was in January 1947, at the Restaurant de la Monnaie in Bern. On the agenda was the requirement from the British side to buy balance wheels, hairsprings, mainsprings, dials, hands, cases, jewels, watch glasses and pins, and screws. Anyone familiar with the minutes of meetings will also know how arguments and cross words are often softened and even filtered out. Alan Gordon Smith and Lenoir were at the meeting. This picture in which they both appear might well have been taken on the trip. Lenoir's boss in the centre had until recently been a senior official at the Ministry of Aircraft Production, used to several years of organising supplies to build Lancaster bombers. Here he was in a restaurant in Bern, arguing with officials over why they couldn't sell him screws. One suspects his language both in and out of the meeting was somewhat less measured than the minutes suggest. The return match was in London in mid-1947. We know that there were tours arranged of British factories for the Swiss guests, no doubt including Smith's high-grade watch production unit at Cheltenham. The aristocracy of British horology swung into action with the clockmaker's dinner, arranged for June at the Goldsmiths Hall. There is an interesting roll call of people involved. Frank Mercer as master, Malcolm Webster as senior warden, Harold Spencer Jones, the astronomer royal, as renter warden, even William Hamilton Short of free pendulum fame as junior warden. On the top table, Frank Mercer sat with a Lord Mayor on one side and on the other side was Paul Ruger, the Swiss minister, effectively the Swiss ambassador in London since 1944, and a key player at the highest level. It was he who had had to deal with angry British demands for Swiss machine tools and parts. Next to him, Alan Gordon-Smith. His neighbour was Paul Rengley, president of the Chambre Suisse d'Horlogerie in La chaux de -Fonds. Later, president of Asuag, the Allgemeine Schweizerische Uhren Industry AG, the most important holding company in the post-war Swiss watchmaking cartel, one of the component parts of the modern Swatch Group. Nearby, Sidney de Coulon, managing director of Eboche SA. He was an important banker first, and then married into the watch world, and over time ran all the key watchmaking concerns, ending up in politics. Above all, he was the man who, as Pierre-Yves Donzé puts it, personifies the triptych of state, watchmaking firms and banks, which was the basis of the watchmaking cartel for about 30 years. Opposite him, Maurice Vaucher was vice president of Assouag. Lenoir sat next to him, opposite Barrett, with other key Swiss industrialists close by. Rengeli, president of the Chambre Suisse d'Horlogerie, wrote to Lenoir in October, three months later, with a gift to thank him for all the hospitality in the summer. His letter has this remarkable sentence. It is with great interest that we visited your factories, and in this regard we have deeply felt that you have shown them to us very openly, knowing that it would not be possible for us to act likewise towards you in Switzerland. For the British, it now seemed between 1945 and 1950 that they were engaged 
in conflict with the Swiss. Put simply, the Swiss view was that it had cooperated hugely on supplies, but also accepted all sorts of restrictions on its business for several years in order to comply with the higher politics of allied wartime diplomacy. Now it was the Swiss turn to exact the price of such cooperation. Against this backdrop of conflict, a major achievement of Lenoir's was his involvement in the successful creation of the Macor Arrangements. Macor SA was actually a company formed in 1946 and owned by a range of Swiss machine tool and watchmaking companies, and it was the conduit through which Swiss machinery reached a limited number of foreign counterparts. To populate factories such as the Cheltenham, Ostragundleis and Wishaw factories of Smiths. Under the Macor arrangements, negotiated from 1947 to 1949, the British could lease vital machine tools from the Swiss, but in return had to accept a range of highly restrictive covenants, such as agreeing not to export watch parts made with the machines, and to buy supplies exclusively from the cartel. In 1949, there was a Macor meeting at Chateau de Chillon, and this is very probably part of the menu, which Robert kept with all the signatures. One can see Alan Gordon Smith's and Rungeli's signatures top left. Moving into the 1950s, alongside the Germans, the Russians also offered an increasing threat of cheap imports into Britain, but leaving aside all these difficulties of foreign competition and dumping and adverse exchange rates and the rest, it was in fact an even more conflicted space than one might first imagine. From the 1930s, the British Watch and Clockmakers Association, pretty much dominated by Smiths, had tended to represent manufacturers and exporters. But there was another influential body on the scene, the horological section of the London Chamber of Commerce. Between the wars and for years after, several members of the section, including its long-standing chairman Joseph Wright, were exclusive agents for various foreign factories which exported large volumes to Britain. It was in their personal interests to see British import quotas removed, licensing abandoned and import duties lifted. Their agenda suited perfectly the laissez-faire mentality of the Conservative government of the 1950s, and thus, while the post-war Labour government helped Gordon Smith, Barrett and Lenoir build a new watchmaking industry, you can appreciate they were actually probably very frustrated, not only by foreign interests, but also by their domestic peers in the horological world. The protections on which Smiths relied gradually disappeared. Indeed, pretty much everything was against Smiths' clocks and watches in the 1950s. Export markets were closing, competition from imports was increasing, and profits were vanishingly small. It was unsustainable. All Smiths' high-grade watches were sold at a loss. For collectors of those watches, Robert Lenoir's babies, the 1950s might seem a golden age for the objects. It is. In the Clockmakers Museum, you can see Edmund Hillary's watch. It was with him when he climbed Everest, but while he was scaling the heights, Smith's was in reality plumbing the depths. Not so much a golden age, but instead a dark age for the business. Look at this letter from Barrett to Lenoir in 1952. He talks about the disappointments and vicissitudes, and then about his optimism for the high-grade watches, but note, although I suppose to most of our colleagues this would appear to be our least promising line. I'm sure Lenoir found much of this disheartening, but his papers remain filled for the next 25 years with work on ways of improving processes, whether for Smith's or other later clients. He always looked to the future. Interestingly, when he was interviewed in the late 1950s for Smith's News, the in-house newspaper, they included this note. It is always interesting to make forecasts. Mr Lenoir, when asked what he thought watches would be like in 50 years' time, gave a surprising answer. I think that they will either be electronically controlled 
or in the form of a receiving apparatus, he said. Fairly forward thinking and quite prescient. There is a tendency to romanticise the products of the past, to see all the clocks and watches we know of any given period as being the wonderful products of golden ages. But the 20th century environment in British horology was a severely contested space. I've argued that the mild-mannered, gentlemanly Robert Lenoir lived out his professional life against a remarkable backdrop of conflict. Obvious conflicts, such as two world wars, yes, but less obvious conflicts in the form of near-constant trade wars and even domestic British interests which lay in direct opposition to each other, let alone the conflict with international competition. Of course, the thought I want to leave you with is this. All that I've been describing is context. The context of all that conflict doesn't alter the quality of the end products made by people that Robert Lenoir helped to manage, that were made on the machines he helped acquire, to the designs he helped produce. It doesn't alter the elegance of the solutions he found to myriad manufacturing problems, always in difficult circumstances. If you hadn't heard the name Lenoir before this lecture, at least now you know a little more. An Englishman, a Frenchman and a watchman were walking along when they were confronted by a genie who told them he would grant them each one wish. The Englishman thought hard and then said, An Englishman's home is his castle. I would like a beautiful Elizabethan manor. The Frenchman shrugged looking at the Englishman and said, Hmm... For me, I want to attract the most beautiful women in the world. The watchman looked at them both in disbelief and said, Me? Pah! You both have a genie that can grant anything you want in the whole wide world, and that's what you ask for? I want a competitive advantage against the Swiss.'